Ooh, that looks tasty. Finally, the day of the tournament is here. And you and your fellow poppers approach the city gates. The excitement in the air is palpable, but so too is the fear. Most of you have never set foot in the wild lands beyond your home. Stories of bandits, giants, and dragons have kept your company your whole life. Yet here you are, ready to leave that life behind and embark on another. Welcome folks, today the Hungry Gamer is back with another game review. Today we're looking at Popper's Ladder, which is designed by Paul Stapleton, who also did the art, and is being published by Bed Sit Games. And what Popper's Ladder is, is it is an adventure game in which each player is trying to prove that they are the most virtuous pauper in the land. And whomever does prove they're the most virtuous, i.e. the first one to claim three of the five virtues, they will be crowned the heir apparent because in this land here of Brighthelm, that's how they do it. I guess the idea is to keep your nobility from getting too uppity and keeping them down to earth and remembering the people, as it were. In any event, if you don't give a darn about how to play this game, then you're going to want to jump ahead to the timestamp that's on the screen right now. All right, so for those of you still with us, what I've done is I've set up this game as a one player experience. This game is meant to be played for two to four, but I can show you how it works with just one. And so let me tell you quickly what it is that we have. So I've picked my pauper here, which is Alf Blomwell, who is a gas miner from Blue Vale, and you'll see his board here. And I'll say that all the boards are the same, with the exception of the starting equipment, and Alf starts with a hard hat that gives him a bonus if he's in a mine or if he is in a fight. And I will also show you that down here, this is where you track your virtues. When you learn your first virtue, you cover up number one, two, three, you cover up three, yay for you, you are the winner. In front of me, you have the board. And what you have is it's broken down, whoops, let me get rid of that card there, it shouldn't be there, is you have a bunch of different regions on the map. And there's four cities in the town, and I'll remove that meeple as well. One, two, three, four. And in each city, there is a shop. And then there are these dark brown regions, which are mines regions. And you can see there's a little mine looking symbol on there, in case you happen to be a colorblind player. You have mountains, you have swamps, you have beaches, and you have forests. And you'll see that there is three of each of those kinds of regions. That's what you have out there. And I'll also say there is a quest on each city. And you can see what it is you have to do for that and a little bit of fluff text there. Now, as I said, the goal of the game is to obtain these virtues. So let's talk about how you do that. And luckily, I can go back to my player board here to explain it. One is the purse. If you discard 40 gems, you learn the virtue of generosity. The idea being you have donated them to the poor or whatever it is. And you earn gems through encounters, which I'll show you in just a minute. There's the recipe book. If you learn five recipes, you gain the virtue of knowledge. Let me pause and show you what recipes are. Recipes are these here. And each player has access to their own dispensary, and they can look at these. And if they are able to earn two of the three things required for each recipe, they'll gain this skill. I think recipe is kind of an odd name for it. I like to look at it as, well, to truly be a thief, you have to steal the feather off of a bird, steal the ectoplasm off of a critter, or steal the scales off of a fish, something like that. But if you get two of the three items, and again, you'll see how you earn items in a little bit, then you are able to discard those, flip it over, and you have now learned this ability, and you gain whatever the ability down here is. And there's a whole, whole bunch of them. You start the game with three recipes that you're trying to learn. If you learn five, again, you gain that virtue. The next one is here, the trophy room. Discard 40 strength to learn the virtue of bravery. And what that means is as you fight things and you defeat things, they go into your trophy room, which is right here, and they all have different strengths. If you discard up a total of 40 strength, you've earned that virtue. And below here, discard one dragon to learn the virtue of magnificence. So if you beat a dragon, you are magnificent. Then we have the journal. 
discard three quests to learn the virtue of fellowship. And so what that is, again, as I have showed you this one already, you accomplish three of these and you can discard it. And so you'll see this one, discard three gems in a wild region containing a guild. If you do that, you gain one equipment and you gain three gems, and then this goes onto your board. It is now a quest that you have learned. So that covers how you win the game. Now let's talk about what you do on your turn. On your turn, you're going to move yourself, your pauper, and you are going to move your bird companion. Now at this point here, it's important for me to say that this is a prototype. While this game is not going to Kickstarter, it has already been printed, it is already on the boat, and it's just going to be available for purchase right around the time this video actually releases, this is still an early prototype version. So there might be some changes here and there. And at the beginning of the game, each player gains a bird companion. And the base version of the birds are all the same. But what these birds do is you can spend four gems to train them and if you train them, you get to flip them over, and then they have different abilities. And this one here can move three spaces instead of just one. This one here lets you peek at the top of the deck, and so on. You get the idea. We've all played games before. We know how that works. So on your turn, you are going to do two things. You're going to move, or you can choose not to move, but you're going to move. And so I'll take my guy here, Alf, and I will move into the forest region next to me. You move region to region, not square to square. And you get there, and then you have the opportunity to explore. So you go over here, and you grab a card from the deck, and you see what you face. Here I have found a hazard. That means I am going into a fight. And this critter is four strength, it's a pest, it's worth two gems if I beat it, and it gives me that particular item if I choose to use it. So I can use it as a recipe item or I can use it for my strength. And it goes down here in one of the three slots. If all the slots are ever filled, you can't go exploring. You have to deal with one of the encounters that are already there. If there's a hazard, you must face the hazard. Now, the way combat works, it's super simple. Each player has an outcome deck. And what you're going to do is you draw one, flip it over, two. I happen to get two strength, which would mean I lose because that is a strength of four, but then you can read what's on the bottom. And I can discard one equipment to add two to my strength. So let's say I had some equipment, I could discard one for plus two, and now I happen to have a four. A tie always goes to the pauper, in which case I would have defeated the firefly, it would go into my trophies, or I could use it as an ingredient for a recipe, and I would claim my two gems. If I lost, that's it. I've just lost the fight. Next turn, I can choose to move away, go somewhere else, or I could face him again. But what I can't do is I cannot go exploring until that hazard has been dealt. And then my pauper is gone, and now I'll go ahead and move my bird. And I'll go ahead and move my bird here into the mountains, and I'll reach over, I'll grab a mountain card, and we'll see what we have. And I happen to find another hazard. Let me grab something else so we can kind of see what's going on. Here we have the Woolard. And here you can pay two gems from your purse on this card to discard one quest card from a city. Pick at the top four cards in the quest deck and place one in that city. And the Woolard stays in this region until it has six gems on it. So until it's used three times, it will be there clogging up one of those spots. Now the other things that you can have, that you might come across while you're exploring are ingredients, like the shell here. So I could find this shell here in the beach region. And it's simple enough. If you go, you can simply pick those up and you use them, as I said, to make your recipes over here. The other thing that you need to know is if you go into town, you can do one of two things. Sometimes there are quests that you must be in that town to complete. Very clearly, that's what you do. And the other thing you can do is, instead of doing a quest, you can choose to go shopping. You pick up all the items in the shop, and you flip it over, and you get to purchase one that you're interested in. And they all tell you what they do on the bottom and have their different costs up here. And each shop also has one legendary item that will give you a specific bonus. And that's it. That's how the game works. The only other thing that's coming to me that I should have showed you is I happen to draw this outcome card that had the special ability on the bottom. All of them don't have that. A lot of them are just a plain number and they number one through six. 
I'll also say that you might find equipment that might help you with your strength. You might have equipment that you use that helps you conquer traps or open chests or anything that you might find out on the board. And the last thing I'll say is there's this die here. This is the Lucky Charm die. Some pieces of equipment or some skills or some items require you to roll your luck. And if you roll poorly, the little frowny guy there, maybe you break your key or you lose your bet. And it can go up with a success and a great success. And other things will use, utilize these numbers that are on there as well. That's it. That's how this game works. And again, it's for two to four players. What do I like about this game? And I have to say that I was very pleasantly surprised by this game because I really didn't know what to expect. I liked the idea behind the game. After all, who doesn't like an underdog story? And that's what this is. They've taken four underdogs, sent them out into the woods and said, go become a hero, come back when you're awesome and one of you gets to be king. And that is, or queen, I should say, there are plenty of female paupers. And that's fun, that's delightful. But especially after it showed up, I didn't know what to make of this board. What on earth am I looking at? And as I've learned, there's you know space for all these cards and that's what's going on. And there's a lot of variety. But so I like the theme and I do feel like this game does a good job of fulfilling the promise of the game. And the promise of the game to me is adventure where you become a hero worthy of being a monarch. And I think it does that. I think there is an incredible variety in these regions and all of these cards, I mean, look at just the size of that. That's just for the swamp region. Some of the regions are even bigger. I mean, this is just the mine region. It's even bigger. And there's a ton of different equipment here that all does different kinds of things. And there's a bunch of different quests. And, and every quest has its own little bit of fluff. And they all have their own art on them. And every encounter has its own little bit of fluff text. It has its own bit of art on it. And all of the art is perfectly cohesive with this delightful, not white, realistic, but not fully cartoon style. As you can see, you look at the rule book here and you can look at good old Alf down here. So I don't know what to make of the art, but I like it. It's just charming. And I'm gonna say that word a lot. This game is charming, but I'm, I'm digging way too deep into this. So let's talk also about the other things that I like about this game. I like this combat mechanic. And I like it because it boils down to it is just a D6 roll. These are numbers one through six in this big fat deck. But because it's this deck of cards, you can kind of count your cards. You can have an idea of what you have in there. And yes, there are some cards that let you stack your deck and so on. And the other thing I like about it is it's the things like this first card that I drew here. There's some things, yeah, it's a two, which is not great, but oh man, if I have equipment, I can throw it away to do something. And if I stack that onto the sword that I have, now I'm suddenly up three or four or five. And so it really can add up. It really makes for interesting play. And there's all kinds of stuff in there. Sometimes if you're next to the city that you're from, you get a bonus. And so it's just very simple, but at the same time, being just a D6 roll, like so many simple games like this are, it's simple with a twist that keeps it interesting. And I like that. And I also, I've already mentioned it, I think there is a fantastic variety in these cards. It really feels like anything could happen when you go into one of these regions and you explore. It might be a trap. It might be a monster. It might be a treasure. It might be an old lady chilling out in the swamp. It might be an assassin's guild. And you can say, you know what? I don't feel like working today. I'm gonna to take the day off. Hey, assassins, here's some gems. Why don't you go down and kill that giant firefly for me? And by the way, make sure you bring me its tail so I can put it into my fleet foot recipe so I can be faster. That's cool. It's ridiculous, but it's adventurous. It's fun. And who can't see that happening in one of these young adult fantasy novels? It's just really well done. And there's all different kinds of guilds out there. The other thing, and I think it's probably the best thing that they have done in this game is this here. Not the token, the bird. Because what it's done is, again, it fits with that theme and you have your little bird companion that I, I named mine Sir Tweetums, in case you were wondering. But what it does is it speeds up 
the game because now I'm going this way, my bird's going this way, and guess what? My bird can do everything that I can with the exception of use equipment because my pauper is a greedy, greedy jerk and he has all of it, and the skills because my pauper is the one that knows the skills. The bird doesn't need to know skills because it's a magical bird and what does it care about being fleet foot? It can fly. And so I just think that's really well done. And so the bird can go out, it can fight things. The bird can go into a city for you and turn in a quest. The bird can buy stuff. It's just really clever and really fun. And then the last thing that I'm gonna throw out there that I think was very clever is looking at these cards here. What it's done is, first off, it's made it a little bit easier to get these items. You need two of the three. But what it's done here is with these colors, is it's telling you the region that you should go to look for it. You can find this stuff in any region, but you're more likely to find it in one of those, depending on the color, and I think that's very clever. I will say it's a shame that there is not, to my knowledge, a way to know what region it is if you are colorblind, so that's a little bit of a miss, but one of the few misses, I think, in this game. So that's a good transition into my quibbles with the game. And I don't have many because I think I feel like I know what this game is. But the first one is this game is very luck reliant and there's just no way around it. Yes, you might have the bird that lets you peek at the decks over here. Yes, you might have an item and a piece of equipment that lets you look at these things, look at more and stack the deck a little, but you only have that piece of equipment if you've been lucky enough to find that piece of equipment or lucky enough that it was in one of these shops and you happen to go to that shop. And so you are totally reliant on what it is that you're drawing and there is nothing you can do about it. It's the same thing in combat. It's totally reliant on your one to six draw, though of course you do have weapons that mitigate that. Now, that said, I don't know that that is a bad thing. I think that's what this game is. And for what it is, this quick adventure, I think it works. I think it kind of simulates the idea that these paupers are going out and have no idea what they're doing. My guy here is a gas miner. When I played against my wife last night, she was a lamplighter. What does a lamplighter know about going out and finding a dragon? It has no idea. I can only assume if you're a lamplighter and you know where to find dragons, accept my apology. But that could rub you the wrong way, that it is highly random. And then the next thing is, while I like the way this board looks, and I like that it's just region movement, it can get cluttered later in the game. And let me show you what I mean. And so I've put cards out and when I played, there weren't this many things already out there, but this could happen. And this is probably 60% full. It's a lot of stuff on this map. And a lot of them have quite a bit to read on them. And so it can look quite busy towards the end of the game. And that's something that some people might not like as much. Next quibble that I have, and the last quibble that I have, is I do think that, again, because this is such a luck-based game, it can wind up dragging on longer than it needs to. Because you know what? You just might not be getting the draws you need, and you can't beat the monsters, or you can't earn enough money, or you can't find what you need for the recipes, or maybe you just can't find a dragon. Though I'll say turns are quick, so it is mitigated a little bit, but you can wind up dragging on a little longer than you want. I will say though, it's pretty easy to, I'm gonna say house rule it to make the games quicker. Clearly you can just decide, well, we're gonna do 25 of these and 25 here and only two quests and only four or whatever you want to do. You can easily shorten it up. And then the last thing that I'll toss out, I know I already said the last thing, but this one's less of a quibble and more of a wish, is I wish there was a solo play variant. Only because it's charming. And I've said that now four times, but it's just charming. And I would love to sit down right now and just pick one of these poppers and see how I can do and explore this world because I want to explore this world more. But I'm happy to tell you that I got in touch with the designer last night actually and just threw it out there. I said, gosh, I wish there was a solo mode. And he said that someone is actually working on it for him and it will be available as a free print and play. So it will be something coming out. So I guess that's why it's not actually a quibble. So there you have it. That is Popper's 
ladder. I think it really feels like a throwback to the games of yesteryear, but actually good. And by that I mean Sorry and Parcheesi and those kinds of games. And if Parcheesi is your favorite game in the world, don't email me. But it's that kind of game with that kind of feel, but it's so much more. And so I think if you like stories like The Prince and the Pauper, and you like that feel, you like The Black Cauldron, any of those stories where you have somebody who is nothing and becomes something great, and yes, I know, you know, the back and forth, The Prince and the Pauper, then this is something for you to check out because you really can tell your own story in this game. You can just play and gather the stuff, but you can also really get into it. When I said earlier, oh yeah, the swamp lady, no, there really is a swamp lady. She's just chilling out in the swamp and she'll do stuff for you. There really is an assassin's guild. There's a thieves guild. You can hire a dude to go do a quest for you. Like that is so story packed. If you're someone that is looking for a light game or an adventure game that you can play with your children, this is one for you. Now, I will follow up with saying that if you're looking for a heavy game or a dark or gritty game, then this is not it. Not at all. I really enjoyed playing this game. My wife really liked the game. She partially really liked the game because she won. So there's that. I think it's a really charming game that is worth looking at. If you look at this board, and you aren't saying, oh my gosh, I can't deal with that, then give it a look. Because I know that I'm very excited to get the production copy of this and play again. I'm excited to play this with my niece, who's in fourth grade. I think she will just go gaga over this. So there you have it, folks. This Pauper's Ladder is a delightful surprise to me. It is an experience that, if you approach it with the right mindset, you can't help but enjoy. So, as always, if you are familiar with the rules of this, and I left out something incredibly important, or I was I made a mistake, let me know. I'll get that into the Klingon subtitles. If you found this video useful, please like it, subscribe, share it, all of those things, because I got lots more coming. As always, thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.